Hello, and welcome to the I3P webinar. I'm Dolores Gibson, and on behalf of I3P Executive Director Dr. Diana Burley and webinar chair David Balanson, I am pleased to host today's webinar, Feature Squeezing, Detecting Adversarial Examples in Deep Neural Networks, featuring Dr. Yang Jang Chi, the University of Virginia. The Institute for Information Infrastructure Protection, or the I3P, is a national consortium of leading academic organizations, national laboratories, and nonprofit research organizations dedicated to strengthening the cyber infrastructure of the United States. Through the consortium, the I3P identifies critical challenges in information infrastructure protection, sustains a collaborative community of multidisciplinary researchers, serves as a trusted partner for industry and government, and provides an independent forum that facilitates the open exchange of ideas. The I3P is hosted at the George Washington University and managed in collaboration with SRI International. I3P webinars feature I3P experts in advanced public awareness of cybersecurity issues facing society. The complimentary 30-minute webinars are held at 12 noon on the third Friday of each month. Our featured expert will speak for approximately 20 minutes. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat window. A moderated Q&A will follow the speaker's remarks. In today's webinar, Feature Squeezing, Detecting Adversarial Examples in Deep Neural Networks, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Yanjun Chi, will explore two feature squeezing methods, reducing the color bit depth of each pixel and spatial smoothing. These simple strategies are inexpensive and complementary to other defenses and can be combined in a joint detection framework to achieve high detection rates against state-of-the-art attacks. Dr. Chi is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Virginia since 2013. She was a senior researcher in the machine learning department at NEC Labs American, Princeton, New Jersey from July 2008 to August 2013. Her research interests are within machine learning, data mining, and bioinformatics. She obtained her PhD degree from the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University in May 2008 and received her bachelor's degree with high honors from Computer Science Department at Tsinghua University, Beijing. She has served as PCs and reviewers for multiple renowned international conferences, journals, and has co-authored the NIPS Machine Learning for Computational Biology Workshop. Dr. Chi has received a career award from NSF and a Best Paper Award at International Conference of BodyNet. Dr. Chi, I'm certain the audience is eager to hear your remarks today. Um, hello. Oh, great to be here. Uh, thank you, Deploy. Uh, thank you uh, for the introduction. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, our work called uh, feature squeezing, detecting adversary examples in deep neural nets. So uh, this is a joint work with my collaborator, um, Professor Evans from uh, University of Virginia and our co-advised student, uh, Wei-Ling Xu. So um, the general background of this work is Deep learning is solving many of our problems now, like in the perception uh, model of autonomous driving cars, the uh, voice assistant uh, using Alexa or spam detector or analyzing genomics. So it really influenced many different aspects of our life. Um, however, the um, recent um, the recent deep learning studies have um, figured the deep learning classifiers are very easily fold. So let's see this uh, slide on page eight. So this hand digit uh, uh, writing of one can be very easily classified as one with 100% of confidence by a modern um, called MNIST deep learning model. However, uh, through uh, very carefully designed um, perturbation uh, noise showed in the second column. So there are different variations of how you design this type of perturbations. And you know, 
I mean, limit the size of the perturbation, and then you just add these type of perturbation on top of the original image to get this new image. People normally name them as adversary uh, examples. And adversary examples will be misclassified by the deep learning models. So it's let's see their first perturbation. Uh, it looks still like a one for um, human vision, but this will be 100% misclassified as four by the original model that classified these first column image very confidently as one. And it will also classify as the sec for the second um, second image on the third row as two with almost 100% of confidence. We'll classify uh, the last one as a two. So um, this property really raises concerns of uh, deep learning um, researchers and also security researchers. So let's move to slide nine. So this slide, it's a more security sensitive setting about face recognizer, deep learning based recognizing of faces. And this is, this is clearly a safety concern. And researchers from Carnegie Mellon just generated this fakely uh, generated uh, glasses. And you can actually tell um, the very easily people on uh, the uh, classifier will uh, recognize this original image into a totally different person. So uh, we can clearly say the um, deep learning classifiers are under adversary attacks. And this type of adversary adapts, um, it's, uh, should, it's uh, makes people worry about the trustworthy property of deep learning classifiers. So uh, what is our solution? And so first, we actually can um, think about just um, making our vision models perfect. Is it possible to make a perfect vision model just like um, uh, imitate uh, human vision? Um, so there are many different efforts in this direction trying to push the learning models uh, to be more robust. Uh, however, we are still very far from a very robust model against the attacks we just show in the previous page. So instead, we try to propose a very simple model, a very simple approach using, uh, rather than we, we propose to not touch the original model, but design very simple and uh, cheap solutions, trying to um, find and detect the adversary examples um, just through the using the original model. So our approach is called feature squeezing. This is a very general framework uh, aimed to reduce the search space available for an adversary. And at the same time, we want to detect adversary examples um, uh, accurately. So the roadmap of um, the, the discussion I want to give today is I want to introduce this framework first. Then uh, I want to provide a, a simple instruct uh, details about two, di two different type of squeezers we propose to use in this framework it's called bit depth reduction and spatial smoothing. So um, the um, type of uh, thread model we uh, evaluated in our framework include two different types. One is this uh, just the traditional adversary assumption. Then the second is we uh, uh, we try to like invade also the adaptive adversary who might be aware of our detection framework. So um, before I introduce our um, free tree squeezing framework, uh, let me introduce a little bit about uh, machine learning and adversary examples. So the basic of machine learning is to learn to find the type of uh, machine uh, models that can generalize from observed historical data to unseen samples. 
So there are two rows I show in this left panel. So the first row showing the training, uh, the training phase of uh, machine learning is to use this historical X, Y pair trying to learn a model F. This is called the training phase. And the second row is called testing phase, or people sometimes also name them as operational or deployment phase. So this is really just, I already have a good model. I'm trying to use it, uh, use it on operational samples. This is called the testing phase. The uh, majority of uh, the adversary example, the research about adversary examples, and also this paper and this project, it's about the second phase, about the testing phase. So we already have a good model, good model trained on historical data, and now we are trying to investigate um, the performance of this uh, nicely trained model. And um, by considering a adversary um, when we use the model. So um, now we are at the slide 13. So the basics of adversary examples is summarized in this page. So for the original sample, so this is um, proposed in iCloud 2014. Um, this paper is called Intriguing Properties of uh, deep neural nets. So when you uh, we the deep neural nets has achieved the really uh, nice performance um, uh, image classification. Uh, for this case, on the left panel, this this left column, and you have a panda image. It will be uh, correctly predicted as panda. However, this paper found out you can just add a very very small noise on top of this X to generate something called um, X prime, X prime equivalent to X plus this perturbation. And this will be, this newly generated sample looks still just a panda to human vision, but will be, it will be classified totally wrong by the same model as a given. So the point of the, um, from the original samples to the adversary samples, there are many, many different ways to search for this perturbation. And some limits is, so most paper are those formulations using this metric space definitions to limit the size of the perturbation R. There can be L inf norm uh, or L0, L, L, L2. So we're going to uh, investigate uh, all these variations uh, in our approach. Um, so in the experimental setting. So this is the background of adversary examples. And now um, our paper, um, actually this page 14 is the fundamental idea of our project feature squeezing. So there's certain properties of adversary examples is if we look at these leftmost and the rightmost, these columns, so this is the original image one, hand digit image one. It's represented uh, as in the grayscale. It will be very nicely predicted by a MNIST deep learning model as one. And if you just add on top of a very, very sm small noise, you will, you will generate the rightmost column. That's the adversary example of this specific one. It will be predicted as two. So um, we can actually tell, I mean, these original sample X and also adversary example X plus R, they're in the grayscale space. Um, let's think about the task of handwritten digits recognition. Um, what means a handwritten digit can be easily recognized? Do we even need those detail level of grayscale uh, values of a per pixel. Um, from semantic level, we certainly do not, because what matters to make a stroke one is really just about if that black and white versus the stroke it looks like a one. So the whole idea really is we think the most uh, important uh, fundamental motivation for us, we think the irrelevant or not useful features 
use in, used in this type of classification test are the major cause that adversary can use to generate perturbations. Uh, you can clearly tell in the rightmost column, there are the smaller strokes generated by adversary perturbations. And those are really just extra features we do not need for classify this stroke as one. So then the whole idea is let's just try to squeeze out those unnecessary features. So for example, we can just convert this grayscale image into a uh, just white black image. So this is the first type of squeezer we tried. It's really just a one bit reduction. So if we do one bit reduction on the original X, this gives us the second column is the squeezed version of this original X. It's black and white, will be perfectly classified as one. And let's see what's the performance of the squeezing performance, a squeezing operation on the adversary examples. And so if we uh, just squeeze out those unnecessary grayscale, uh, grayscale pixels, we can still keep most of the strokes very nicely. And this will be classified correctly as one by the original model. Now let's see, we compare original X versus the squeeze X. Their predictions are very, very similar. And let's compare and then let's see the right half, the adversary prediction versus prediction uh, X plus R versus the squeezed version X plus R, the prediction is very different. That's the most important um, the property we use to design our detection framework. For a good legitimate example, squeezing will still give you similar prediction. For the adversary examples, we hypothesize, we can look for some type of feature squeezers that squeeze out, that distract those adversary perturbation, trying to push the X plus R, the squeeze version get the original prediction. Um, so that's the fundamental motivation of our feature squeezing framework. And then we summarize it in this paper in NDSS 2018. And the uh, idea is very nicely summarized in this summary figure. And those adversary generated type of handwritten digits, hopefully our squeezers can squeeze out, can remove, uh, can distract the adversary perturbations. And on this uh, geometric uh, image space view, uh, we essentially the feature squeezing, trying to um, coalesce different images into one image and hopefully reduce the perturbation space um, that is available to a adversary. So, um, yeah, so I already summarized page 17. So we're trying to reduce the feature space that unnecessarily too large. So our detection work um, works like following. So we have the original input, we feed into the model to get prediction one. This is a prediction on the original input. Then we have a squeezed version input, we feed it into the same model, we've got a prediction um, another prediction, squeezed prediction. We calculate its distance among the two prediction vectors. So if this prediction, this distance, the summary of the differences among the two prediction is too large, and we think that's an adversary example. And this is clearly showed by that motivation page. If it's a good example, the Prediction, original prediction versus squeeze prediction should be similar. If this is an adversary example, the original prediction supposed to be a wrong prediction versus squeeze prediction supposed to be a right prediction, the prediction distance supposed to be large. When it's large, it's highly likely to be a adversary example. So um, the bit depth of this white black kind of squeeze operation works really uh, intuitively nice on grayscale, but on the 
uh, image like uh, color images, and there's some kind of um, pepper and salt, uh, salt type of attacking through L0 attack. The bit depth reduction works not as nicely. So we have some other type of squeezer, like the uh, spatial squeezer, and it's uh, designed specifically for that type of attacking. So uh, in summary, there are many different ways attacking strategies. So we just um, hopefully for each attacking strategies, there are certain good squeezers exist. And then the issue is, how could you know what strategy attack a attacker will use? So, um, and then we just propose this really simple joint strategy. So when we have multiple different squeezers, we compare the distance of our original prediction versus each one of the squeeze prediction. We got a distance D1, D2, maybe onto um, the squeezers, the case squeezer we use. We just use the max score of that distance score. And then if the max score is larger than a certain threshold, we hypothesize we just predict this certain example as adversary or, uh, or not. Um, so um, in this paper, we tried two. One is speed depth reduction. The other is called spatial smoothing. Um, so there's clearly the strategy we're using now is a very simple approach. Uh, rather than uh, using the max, there can be many different a more complex or uh, complex way to figuring out which one of the squeezer, uh, what D should we use. So this is one of our current future work to have a more um, uh, principled strategy to pick what uh, which squeezer to use. So now we are on page 20. So. Um, the first strategy we use is called bit depth reduction. So very simple. And on the gray scale, we just uh, convert it into black and white. Uh, numerically, the point is really is, so our pixel values are described as digits in uh, computers. And then when you fit into the, um, the neural network type of machine learning models, you need to convert it actually into, uh, you, you need to normalize it to make the the um, the model runs stably. So, but again, it's still it's about just um, for the color cases. There are only 256 possible numerical values, and for black and white, there are only two types. So, if you do the grayscale, it's actually um, you can just do a lot of different reductions. You either just reduct using 0 0.5 uh, to reduct it into two different values. Uh, or you can use three bits to reduct it into uh, eight different possible values. So in this figure, we use a one bit uh, reduction. We reduce to one bit. In the end, we just use 0 0.5 in the operation, 0 0.5 to just do thresholding. So if the value is smaller than 0 0.5, we make it zero. If it's larger than 0 0.5, we make it one. So for the regional samples, it will just become a binary vector. And for the adversary samples uh, from the bottom, it will also convert it into adversary, uh, into zero one uh, binary vector. So if the changes are super small, it's highly likely and our um, two binary vectors will be very, very similar. So let's show uh, on page 21, we show you more um, this um, adversary examples and also their, um, the resulting squeezed version of examples. The first column is the good example. After this binary filter, it's just still the strokes, it's still one. And the third, uh, the, all the rest of uh, four columns are four different type of attacks. And some attacks attacking more pixels but with smaller changes on each pixel. Some attacks uh, attacks less number of pixels, but have a little bit bigger changes on each pixel. Um, so no matter what, um, if you apply and the filter can remove the perturbations and keep the important strokes that 
is about the semantics of one. So uh, the performance is, um, you can tell, I mean, um, on two different data, um, if you apply, without applying the, the squeezer, the on legitimate examples, the performance 99, but on adversary examples, only 13. Um, if you apply for the one bit debt reduction, the performance uh, still keeps similar, it's 99.3. The, um, on the adversary example, it improves to 62.7. So similarly, it also uh, has similar uh, um, trends on ImageNet, a much larger data. So the most basic idea, again, let's repeat it, is the differences of uh, original example versus the squeeze example, the model prediction uh, are similar, and the average examples in the model, the prediction are different. So here we show the distribution of the distance of the original prediction versus the squeeze prediction on the MNIST. Most legitimate examples have scores like zero, and the average example has scores uh, close to two. Just based on this figure, we can actually tell very easily we can um, distinguish logistic examples versus adversary examples. And then uh, another um, squeezer is called uh, spatial smoothing. It's really just um, uh, um, all the ideas are come from image processing. The uh, one specific squeezing we use called medium filter. It's very effective uh, in eliminating salt and pepper noise in the history. Um, it just replaced the middle pixels using the median value of the surroundings. And there's one more, it's called non-local mean smoothing. It uses patches and it can preserve more edges. So um, the details are in the paper. I'm not going to explain how we do, uh, how the smoothing uh, work. So let's see the performance of this squeezing on the color images. So in this figure, we apply the median smoothing and the non-local mean smoothing on the color images called airplane, this specific image. So the first column is the original image. Um, it will be classified nicely uh, as um, airplane using the original model with 94 percentage of uh, confidence. After median smoothing, it will still um, classifies as uh, airplane and airplane. Um, but after this uh, attacking is the BRM attack and GSMA attack in the second column and third column. One is classified as truck, the other is classified as automobile. So median smoothing um, works um, not that nicely on this image. So it was uh, wrongly classified as a ship. But if you do the non-local mean smoothing, these a uh, smooth version will be again classified as airplane, and the both median smoothing and non-local smoothing work nicely on the GSMA attack on the third column. So uh, similarly, and again, so um, the performance of median smoothing improves dramatically on the third column of this table. This original model have only 2%, 2 percent, 2.78 percentage on the adversary examples, but if you have the median smoothing, it will be pushed into 68. If uh, on the uh, non-local mean smoothing, it will be improved into 57. So the original uh, model on this good example, on the logistic examples, the performance uh, about 19, 69 on the third column, on the fourth column, and then after applying the squeezing, the performance uh, wasn't changed that much. Okay, so um, yeah, so clearly after squeeze version, the uh, we can recover uh, the correct predictions. And there are a lot of other potential squeezers. Please feel free to check them out from our paper and also this list of references. So in experiment, we tried on three different data. And um, so the details are also in the paper. So let me move to this obvious adversary uh, results. So again, just to re-summarize what is our prediction framework, we use this max D1 and D2 or multiple different squeezers. 
larger than a certain threshold to decide if this is adversary or not. But how could you know the T? The most important is how could you know that threshold? So we actually use a training data just to select a threshold T to make sure the first positive read on that training data is within 5%. And then we use this learned threshold T on a validation data to evaluate detection performance. So this page, page 33, summarizes about uh, detection performance on MNIST using one bit reduction across actually totally 11 different type of attacks. And our um, one bit um, that squeezer can detect almost like 100% on this L-inf and L-2 type of attacks. It doesn't work very uh, greatly on this Kalini and Wagner zero attack. So we then um, add the uh, median smoothing and then uh, works a little bit better. Then we do a joint of one bit, reduc one bit depth reduction plus the median smoothing. This is a joint squeezer. And uh, it improves the detection performance uh, dramatically from 55 of one bit and 82 of median into 91. So um, clearly, there, these squeezers are complementary to each other. So similar, uh, we have observed similar performance. Um, MNIST, CIFAT 10, and ImageNet. So on um, MNIST, we achieved 99% of AUC scores. On CIFAT 10 and ImageNet, uh, we are about 96, 95, and 94. So we think uh, if we add more proper squeezers, this detection performance will be further, uh, can be further improved, uh, improved. So this is another uh, future work we work on now. So I'm going to skip the, the adaptive attack. Uh, so feel free to uh, read this a few slides. It's really about uh, if attacker is aware of our detectors, and they're going to create adversary examples, and how would you do? So we showed that um, actually this type of adaptive strategy generate the images. It's in um, page 40. They are going to the images, uh, adversary images generated through this type of uh, adaptive adversary are mostly very hard to read. And also their um, distance measure is also much bigger from, um, need, it needs to have a much bigger perturbations compared to the uh, without the detection uh, case. So, um, so our conclusion really is feature squeezing hardens the deep learning models through very simple strategies. And feature squeezing gives advantages to the defense side in this armories and also against adaptive adversaries. And our strategies are simple and also uh, efficient and cheap. Uh, thank you. Lois, uh, this is the end of the presentation. OK. Thank you, Dr. Chi. Um, at this time, I welcome and offer the um, audience to send any questions that they have through our uh, chat window. And also ask you, Dr. Chi, if there's anything else that um, you would like to elaborate at this time for your talk. Um, so because we have no questions, maybe just let me show one more slide about adaptive adversary. Um, so to uh, counter um, the adaptive adversary, we also propose a strategy called randomization, randomized bit depth reduction. So in our original bit depth reduction, we use a fixed threshold to do this one bit, 0 0.5. So we can just actually randomize this uh, the threshold into uh, a normal distributed uh, threshold. So there's a lot of randomness in that, um, in the threshold. So it can be 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So this randomization clearly strength, uh, it strengthens our uh, detection uh, against the adverse adaptive adversary, which is showed in the la next slide. Uh, in page 40. So if the uh, attack, a deterministic detector, and the upper half is about those examples 
um, bypass our detector, can fool our detector. If you add a randomized detector, this add the uh, the lower half add those images uh, can fool our detector. So compare the upper half and the lower half, you can tell a lot of images are really bad and unrecognizable to human visions. And these distance measure uh, these uh, the size of the R that perturbation also uh, a lot larger, which is showed in the number of the right. And there's a question that has come in. And um, the question is, what happens if you perform feature squeezing while training the model? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yes, um, we are actually uh, testing this. Uh, we try to retrain a model with the squeezed version of input. And we think it, the performance should be uh, uh, better. The next question says, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if this approach can be applied to regression networks, not only classification networks. Also, is this method scalable to handle images with many objects? Um, th this is a great question too. So uh, in summary, our feature squeezing is really just a uh, pre-filtering step. And I think um, we actually can. It should be extendable to regression problems, and but we have to design a better um, detection scoring function. And so, so far we are just doing the uh, original prediction versus the squeeze prediction larger than certain threshold. And we, I think we need to design more um, intelligent strategy um, trying to uh, figure out how to get better T and also not just using this. We currently, we use L1 distance measure. Um, that makes sense for classification output vector, but for regression type of vector, we, re we need to design a new scoring function. So this is the first question about uh, regression. For the second question about scalability, um, I think, yes, um, because our strategy is very, very cheap. And I don't think scalability is even uh, a concern for us. But again, when you have many different objects, the scoring function, uh, scoring function is important. We need to design a, a more carefully um, and principled uh, scoring function for those cases. Thank you, Dr. Chi. Is there anything else you wanted to cover and any other additional slides or comments for the audience today? Uh, the last thing, maybe because I was kind of rushed about adaptive adversary, so just trying to uh, show this figure is, so this adaptive adversary proposed by Berkeley, uh, this Berkeley group, is um, using this strategy showed in page uh, 30, actually 30, uh, 36. So it was trying to use a gradient-based approach to figure out these are the perturbation to generate x prime. These the formulation they use makes the differences of x and x prime really unbounded. So we re uh, plot the uh, they are generated the adversary adaptive adversary images by categorize according to this differences of the R. So um, the x axis is the differences of the R and the y-axis is the adversary, they are adapted to adversary success read. So if you show these figures and the, their uh, differences that generate the perturbation are super large, even though they claim they always gener gener can fool our detectors. But in fact, if you use this normal um, bounded R, that R is how much perturbation you allow. If you're using this generic uh, threshold to cut that uh, 
size of the perturbation, which is 0 0.3. People normally use 0 0.3. These successful detection rate of this adaptive adversary is only about 0 0.01, about only 1%. So which means our detector uh, is pretty robust against um, their adaptive adversary if we um, limit the perturbation within this normal range people normally use. Thank you, Dr. Chi. Yeah, I think this is the last thing um, yeah, I want to share. Okay. So I would like to thank Dr. Chi for taking the time to present today for the ICP on her work. I'd also like to thank the audience um, for joining us. Oh, great. Thank you. And I just want to remind everyone that I3P webinars feature I3P experts and advance public awareness of cybersecurity issues facing society. Our next webinar is next year, January 18, 2019. Our featured topic is Detecting User Experience Issues of the Tor Browser in the Wild. And that speaker will be Mr. Kevin Gallagher, who's a doctoral candidate at New York University. Again, thank you, Dr. Chi, so much for presenting today, and I thank our audience for joining us. Everyone have a wonderful holiday. You too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.